Good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the latest episode of our Global webinar series. My name is Daniel Quigley. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing here at DSI. As always, we hope you, your families, and colleagues are all staying safe and healthy. Last week, we were treated with a guest speaker as Dr. Carl Slater from the University of Warwick outlined some of the capabilities of the Global and how it is helping them drive alloy development and research in, the, in steel processing. Today, we're honored to welcome another guest speaker, Dr. John Lippold from the, the Ohio State University. As always, our goal will be to keep this webinar to one hour or less. If time allows, we will have Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have questions, please submit them using the chat feature here in the webinar. We have just over 500 people registered for today's webinar, so we won't have time to address every question. However, if needed, we can connect you with Professor Lippold for an offline discussion. Video of this presentation will be available online soon. You'll be able to find a link to this video as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website, which is www.clebol.com, and clicking on the resources link in the top navigation bar, and then click on webinars. And there you can view past webinars and sign up for future webinars. Next week's webinar will uh, be presented by Dr. Wayne Chen. Uh, he will focus on casting applications and semi-solid processing studies that can be conducted on the Global platform. It is my honor to introduce our speaker, Professor Lippold. Uh, he has a strong, he has a long and prestigious career leading welding research efforts, both in academia and industry. And for those of you that are familiar with the history of the Glebel, uh, you've probably heard of Dr. Warren Savage, Doc Savage, as uh, his friends called him. Uh, Doc Savage was one of the three inventors of the Glebel and was a well-known welding researcher. Uh, Doc's work was groundbreaking and it's often cited to this day However, one of his greatest accomplishments was the legacy that he left behind through his students. Over the years, Doc mentored and advised a number of researchers who would go on to do great things. And Professor Lippold is one of those students who has become a, a guru in his own right. And he's in turn helped develop a new generation of researchers throughout his career. It's our honor to have him present today. Uh, so now I'd like to hand this presentation over to Professor Lippold. John, thank you for preparing, uh, for sharing your insight today with us, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, Dan, thank you very much. Um, and I, um, sorry, and welcome everybody who uh, either got up very early this morning or who is staying up late uh, to listen to this this presentation. Uh, the, my, my topic today is a little bit different than the abstract I put together. Um, I want to talk uh, generally to begin with just about uh, weldability in general and, and, and what this term weldability really means. I know a lot of the audience are probably non-welding people. Uh, so I'd like to introduce this concept a little bit and then describe some testing procedures uh, that have been around in many cases for many years going back into the 50s and 60s uh, that we still use today to try to evaluate weldability, although perhaps with a, a bit more uh, sophistication. Let's see here. Um, for some reason, I can't advance my slides. There we go. Okay, so just a little bit about myself. I don't want to go through all this, but uh, the, because this is recorded, if people are interested uh, in my background, they they can they can take a look. Uh, as uh, Dan mentioned, Dan, thank you for that uh, nice introduction. Um, I earned all three of my degrees at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, my advisor was Doc Savage, uh, pictured here in the late '80s. Uh, just a few years before he died, actually. Um, after I left RPI, I spent some time at Sandia National Laboratories in California, uh, joined Edison Welding Institute in 1985, which is the, actually the year they opened, and um, then uh, left EWI, took a faculty position at Ohio State, and retired from Ohio State uh, about five years ago. Uh, I still remain relatively active. Uh, I'm still advising two graduate students uh, 
and um, working in a variety of different different technical areas. I'm also editor in chief of, of Welding in the World. Um, I want to draw your attention uh, on the right hand side of the screen here, uh, just to some textbooks uh, that I've published in conjunction with a variety of people. Uh, the one highlighted here in red, Welding Metallurgy and Weldability, a lot of the topics I'll be talking about today, uh, you can find a bit more detail on those uh, in this particular textbook. I'm also uh, excited to, to note that uh, we do have a, another contract with Springer and we're currently wor I'm currently working on a book with Bud Bazelak uh, on welding metallurgy and weldability of, of lightweight alloys. Uh, that will probably come out sometime in, in 2021. Okay, so the question is often asked, what is weldability? A lot of people use this term to infer a lot of different aspects of welding. I include here the definition uh, from the American Welding Society uh, capacity to of a material to be welded under fabrication conditions into imposed or imposed into specific suitably designed structure and to perform satisfactorily in the intended service. So this covers a lot of territory, obviously, in terms of a, a definition, but really what it involves is the ability to fabricate materials successfully, often that means without cracking. Um, to put them into service and have them perform satisfactorily. So you can take a perfectly good weld, but in some cases put it into service and it may fail in a short period of time. And in many cases, weldability involves the ability to repair and rework materials. So there are a lot of weldability tests out there. Uh, in fact, if, if you go and count up all the tests that have been proposed or published in the open literature. There's somewhere on the order of 200. Um, very few of these are standardized, and I'll come back to that point a little bit later because this is a real issue uh, in, in the welding field in terms of comparing results from different laboratories. There are two basic types of weldability tests. There are those that are simulative in that they try to simulate some aspect of the thermomechanical response of welded joints or tests that are called go or no go which means you run a test and the sample either cracks or it doesn't crack and that is basically indicative of the weldability of the, the material and 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 again i'll come back to the these points a little bit most of the tests that i'm going to talk about today are simulative in nature in that uh, they normally involve some laboratory equipment that applies a stress or a strain to the material in order to force a material to crack under certain imposed conditions. So the weldability issues that we normally deal with from a fabrication standpoint are listed here. Um, obviously, when you take a base material and remelt it, uh, as when you make a fusion weld, uh, the weld resolidifies with a microstructure and often properties that are very much different than the base metal. And this can create fairly significant problems, especially with materials that are specially thermomechanically processed to produce a given grain size or precipitate distribution to give strength, ductility, toughness, etc. You now make a weld on that material and you completely destroy all that thermomechanical processing. And so dealing with the solidification behavior of welds is often very important. Um, many materials, including aluminum alloys, some nickel-based alloys, some of the stainless steels are susceptible to what we call solidification cracking. That is, they crack during or at the end of the solidification process. And there are a number of tests that have been developed to address solidification cracking. We also need to deal with what happens in the heat affected zone. So when you make a, a fusion weld on a material or even a solid state weld, you normally heat 
the surrounding the area or the material surrounding the well to very high temperatures. This also causes changes in properties relative to those of the base metal and we find that a lot of problems in some of our structural materials are associated with the heat affected zone where we do not have the opportunity as we do in the weld metal to change the composition by adding a filler metal. So the heat affected zone often becomes a weak link uh, in, in a, uh, a welded structure. There are certain cracking mechanisms associated with the heat affected zone uh, like glacian cracking and solid state cracking mechanisms. I'll discuss a couple of those today. And then of course, uh, there's hydrogen induced cracking. This is primarily associated with steels, can occur in other materials, but normally high strength steels are uh, those susceptible to hydrogen induced cracking. So these are the main weldability issues that we deal with from a fabrication standpoint and around which a lot of weldability tests have been developed. So one of the issues I've been working on for many, many years now is how to better introduce weldability into the alloy development process. So when someone develops a new alloy, and some of you probably work for materials producers who are constantly looking for uh, better materials, uh, you tend to focus on normally mechanical properties or uh, service properties with respect to corrosion, elevated temperature properties, et cetera. But normally you're trying to optimize things like strength, ductility, toughness, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, weldability is usually not considered until late in the alloy development process, if, if at all. There are materials out there that have been developed for structural applications where the concept of weldability at the alloy development stage has never been considered. And many new and advanced materials are never fully implemented because of poor weldability. And there are lots of examples of this where a new ultra high strength steel for ship hull applications with 100 and K, 180 KSI yield strength never makes it into a ship because nobody can figure out how to weld this material without it being susceptible to hydrogen induced cracking or have reduced toughness or have other some other deficient mechanical property that would prevent its implementation. And again, the, the, one of the problems here is that the concept of weldability is considered only after the alloy has been developed, not during the alloy development process. So why is weldability not part of the alloy development process? It's a, it's a simple question and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, often, if mechanical engineers or even metallurgists are developing these materials, they often don't know what test methods to use. You can go to the literature, as I said previously, and find 200 weldability tests. Which ones do you use to basically prove the weldability of your material. Weldability in general is a complex issue and often very poorly understood. I, I often say that if I had a room of 200 people and I went around and asked each one of them to define weldability, I'd get 200 different definitions of that particular term. So um, it, it, it it, I gave you the AWS definition earlier, and obviously that is, is a somewhat vague description of the term weldability. Uh, one of the other issues that comes in the alloy development process is the welding studies can be pretty immaterial intensive. So if you have to make up large heats of material of experimental alloys and do weldability tests on them, that can get pretty doggone expensive. And so often weldability testing is not done simply from a, from a cost standpoint. So what's the solution? Well, devising test techniques that are easy to interpret and provide useful quantifiable information is one good starting point. Um, many of the weldability tests that we have are not easily interpretable. Um, we probably need to select tests that require small amounts of material. And 
I'm going to show our OSU philosophy here in a, in a few minutes, and, and that's sort of what we have, have focused on. The other thing that is of use nowadays that wasn't 20 years ago, maybe even 10 or 15 years ago, is the use of computational modeling and simulation in conjunction with testing. So can we use computational modeling smartly in order to limit or minimize the number of weldability tests that we actually need to use or to use computational modeling to point us in, in the right direction in terms of the types of weldability tests that we need. So our approach here at, at OSU is, is, is shown here. I, I've listed uh, the weldability issue in the left-hand column, and then some evaluation techniques that, that we commonly use. So from the standpoint of solidification behavior, uh, first of all, we can use uh, computational modeling. Uh, the the Shile module within ThermalCalc is one example of how you can actually predict solidification behavior, solidification temperature ranges, microstructure, et cetera, associated with solidification of a fairly complex material. From an experimental standpoint, uh, we can make what are called small button melts, and we can use uh, single sensor differential thermal technique a differential thermal analysis technique that's been developed here at OSU to actually measure solidification temperature ranges and transformation behavior in fairly complex materials uh, simply by melting and solidifying a material in the form of a small button. Um, from the standpoint of solidification cracking, we've uh, tended at least here to focus on the Vera strength test, and I'll spend some time talking about that, and something called the Caspin tear test that was developed many, many years ago at Westinghouse. Um, we have basically redeveloped this test for our own purposes. When we look at heat affected zone behavior, uh, most of the testing that we do at OSU in terms of quantification of weldability involves the Glebal. So the, the, the original Glebal was developed really to study heat affected zone behavior in materials in stainless steels and structural steels back in the 50s and 60s. But we can also use it very effectively uh, to look at heat affected zone cracking phenomena. And I'm going to de uh, describe briefly three tests that we use at OSU to uh, evaluate various forms of, of heat affected zone cracking. And finally, hydrogen induced cracking is important in structural steels, particularly high strength steels. And we have developed uh, a modified implant test. This is a test that was originally developed uh, at the French Welding Institute by Henry Grandjean back in the 50s and 60s. And we use this test because it uses just a very small amount of material, uh, basically small pins that are loaded under appropriate conditions to evaluate hydrogen-induced cracking. So uh, I'm going to spend uh, a little bit of time talking about cracking behavior and heat-affected zone behavior uh, of the tests listed um, here in this particular chart. So if we think about weld cracking, um, it's it's really a ductility issue, right? Why is a weld crack? A weld cracks because you impose a strain on it, normally during the solidification or cooling process of the weld. And if that strain exceeds the inherent ductility of the material, the material cracks. And so, we, we there's two approaches. Uh, we can try to increase the ductility of the material, or we can try to decrease the strain that's applied during the welding process. Decreasing the strain becomes very problematic because the material has a, a, a distinct coefficient of thermal expansion and contraction, and you're somewhat limited in terms of what you can do from the standpoint of process selection or heat input to affect that. 
So what we'd really like to do is be able to understand the ductility of the material through weldability testing and to manipulate that weldability or that ductility in a positive fashion, that is make the material more ductile ductile and certain critical temperature ranges in order to do that. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about two different forms of cracking that we see in structural materials. What's listed here as segregation cracking is basically solidification cracking occurs within what's called the brittle temperature range of the material. And in some materials, something called ductility dip cracking, where in the solid state, rather than having a relative continuous and decreasing ductility as you move to room temperature. Uh, some materials, stainless steels, nickel-based alloys, actually show a precipitous drop in ductility over a, a specified temperature range. And so we've developed tests to try to understand and quantify uh, both of these uh, loss in ductility phenomena. It's also a grain boundary problem. So the interesting thing about cracking in welds, virtually all cracking that occurs in welds other than some forms of hydrogen induced cracking is that cracking occurs along grain boundaries. This is an example of a grain boundary forming in the fusion zone uh, where we have a solidification grain boundary where uh, groups of, of cells or dendrites come together to form that boundary something called a migrated grain boundary that is a crystallographic boundary that pulls away from that solidification grain boundary. <clears throat> we'll see that this migrated grain boundary becomes the site of what's called ductility dip cracking in a lot of materials. Um, there's a lot of detail. We've done a lot of studying of microstructure and solidification behavior in welds. Uh, if referring back to the, my textbook on on welding metallurgy and weldability, you can find a lot more detail there regarding the metallurgical development of these boundaries. Here are a couple examples of weld solidification cracking. Um, a solidification along solidification grain boundaries, alloy 718 is a nickel based super alloy, it contains niobium, is known to be susceptible to solidification cracking. <clears throat> alloy 2219 is aluminum copper alloy. We see solidification grain boundaries here where we get solidification cracks. And, and so again, these are typical uh, examples of solidification cracking that can occur in, in structural materials. So how do we quantify weld solidification cracking from a, a fundamental standpoint? Well, one of the things that we want to do is be able to quantify what we call this brittle temperature range. And so this is the drop in ductility that occurs over the range of solidification. So at the liquidest temperature where the material's 100% liquid, it has basically infinite ductility. Once it becomes 100% solid at elevated temperature, it also has very high ductility. <clears throat> But the temperature range in between within the solidification temperature range, we see this drop in ductility. And if we superimpose on this ductility curve, the strains that develop during welding due to cooling and shrinkage, uh, 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 thermal shrinkage during welding, depending on the strain that builds up, if the the strain exceeds the inherent ductility of the material as shown here in the red line and the blue line, we form a crack. If the strain rate is less than the, the strain is less than the inherent ductility of the material, the material doesn't crack. So preventing materials from solidification cracking uh, means that we either decrease the strain through how we make the weld and, and, and how it's, it's strained during the welding process and during cooling, or we manipulate the ductility curve, uh, making the brittle temperature range number one higher or and or narrower. And so an approach from the standpoint of alloy development or filler metal development is to try to minimize and manipulate the, the BTR uh, through uh, composition control. So a number of tests for solidification cracking have been developed over the years. I don't have an exact count, but I <clears throat> would guess there's probably a hundred of them out there. Um, 
recognizing the complexity of this back in the 1960s, uh, Savage and Lundin at RPI <clears throat> developed something called the variable restraint test, shortened to Verastraint test. <clears throat> the original test uh, used fairly large samples, um, two inches wide by 12 inches long by half inch thick. Those samples <clears throat> often required bending bars to uh, allow them to conform to the die block as you bent them around a die block as you made the weld. Um, these, uh, this, the original test would induce both fusion zone and heat affected zone cracking in the sample. Um, and this test over the years has been adopted pretty much internationally to study uh, weld solidification and liquidation cracking. Um, this is just the evolution of the test. I'm not going to spend any time here, but there have been a lot of different types of varistrain tests uh, developed. Uh, TWI developed a trans varistrain test, which isolates cracking in the weld metal. Um, and here at OSU, we I'm going to describe a, a method we've developed for um, basically quantifying solidification crack the solidification cracking temperature range there are three types of vera strength tests there's a spot vera strength test there's a longitudinal vera strength test which was the original design of savage and lundine and then if you weld in the other direction uh transverse to the bending load this is called the the, the transverse vera strength test the advantage of the transverse test is that it isolates cracking in the fusion zone, and you can also induce ductility dip cracking. The spot fair strength test is used almost exclusively to look at heat affected zone cracking, that is cracking that occurs around this spot weld uh, in, in the base metal heat affected zone. The test is actually quite simple. Uh, the strain that is developed in the outer fibers of the sample as you bend it is simply uh, determined by the thickness over the sample by two times the radius of the die block plus the thickness of the sample itself. Uh, the measurement and quantification of cracking susceptibility <clears throat> is a little bit complicated. Uh, these are all the different methods for measuring cracking susceptibility. Total crack length is widely used. Maximum crack length and maximum crack distance are also widely used. Uh, you can also determine a threshold strain for cracking or what we call a saturated strain where the, the, the cracking basically levels out at high strain levels. So our approach at, at OSU is to measure something called maximum crack distance, where if a crack that forms at the trailing edge of the weld pool, we basically measure the distance from the solid liquid interface at the time of bending to the tip of the crack. The reason we do this is this represents the isotherm or the temperature range over which cracking actually occurs. And so what we're really trying to get at is the temperature range over which cracking occurs as a measurement of the cracking susceptibility. The data that is generated from the vera strength tests often looks something like this in terms of maximum crack distance where at low strains, there is no cracking. You reach some threshold strain where cracking is initiated. And then at higher strains, uh, you uh, basically level out. And so we can either use threshold strain or this maximum crack distance as saturated strain to quantify the cracking susceptibility. So this is an example of what cracking might look like at the trailing edge of the weld pool. This is a plan view, so we're looking down on the, on the surface of the weld, the instantaneous solid liquid interface. And then we're simply, from a quantification standpoint, we're measuring the distance from this location to the back end of this crack to the, determine the temperature range over which solidification cracking occurs. So if we know this maximum crack distance, we know the velocity at which we're making the weld. So the rate at which this solid liquid interface is, is traveling, uh, we divide MCD by 
velocity that gives us a time and we superimpose that on the cooling curve so this is the cooling curve as the weld cools uh, from the liquidus temperature through the solidification temperature range that gives us a value of solidification cracking temperature range which is similar to the BTR brittle temperature range and is an actual measure of the temperature range over which cracking occurs. So if we look at SCTR data for a variety of materials, austenitic stainless steels, nickel base alloys, uh, it can show quite a variation in type 304L, which solidifies as ferrite. That value is fairly low. In stainless steels that solidify as austenite, the SCTR value is much higher. Uh, there's a, a range of values in nickel base alloys. These all solidify as austenite, but have different alloying elements that make them more or less susceptible to solidification. So this value of SCTR becomes a real world measure of cracking susceptibility. And frankly, these values match up pretty well to what is experienced in, in actual practice. Uh, how do we use this data? If we look at some of these values now in a chart and we look at restraint level, if the restraint level is low, you might determine that only uh, materials with an SCTR over maybe 200 or 200 degrees C are susceptible. As the restraint level increases though to medium and or high levels, the critical SCTR value ab above which materials are susceptible to solidification cracking are what are shown above the, the dotted line here. So some of the materials down on this end of the spectrum, some duplex stainless steels, 304L, 316L that solidify as ferrite, we know are very, very resistant to solidification cracking and that is, is recognized and verified by their SCTR value. Okay, uh, there is an ISO standard for the Verastrain test. Uh, this was basically developed by the Germans. Um, uh, it is a reasonable standard, but it there are certain things it does not consider, and frankly, we don't use this standard at OSU, uh, because primarily because its method of quantification is total crack length, which I don't believe is, is a reasonable measure of susceptibility. And the example I give is if your total crack length is two millimeters, you could have one two millimeter crack or 20.1 millimeter cracks. Well, I guarantee you from a weldability standpoint, you'd prefer cracks that are 0.1 millimeter rather than one crack that's two millimeters. So I, I don't think the total crack length measure is, is appropriate. So there are some issues with the very strength test. Uh, there's no standard machine design. Everybody who has a very strength machine has built their own to their own specification. There's a lot of different sample sizes and thicknesses. There's no guidelines on the weld pool size. So, you know, how big is the weld pool? The bigger the weld pool, the more and the higher the heat input, the higher the tendency for cracking. And so there needs to be some some things there. It, the quantification method is not standardized. These are the things that people typically use. The other thing with the Verastrength test is it, it can't account for a, a phenomenon called backfilling, uh, where uh, liquid films along grain boundaries can actually come in and backfill and repair cracks. There are alloy systems out there that are designed to do that, and the Verastrain test does not do a very good job of, of predicting their weldability. So we've developed an alternative um, to the Verastrain test. We use, frankly, both the Verastrain test and something called the Caspin tear test. The Caspian tear test is shown here. It starts with melting a small button of material of desired composition. Uh, we put it in a, a test chamber. I'll show this in a little bit more detail in the next slide. But basically what we end up is doing is, is casting a whole series of pins of different lengths of the material who's of composition of interest. These pins range in weight from about uh, 12 grams up to about 20 grams, and so the amount of material required is fairly insignificant. And what happens, not surprisingly, as the pin gets longer under solidification conditions, the strain that builds up during solidification increases. And at some point in time, 
you'll tend to get a crack uh, in these pins. Sometimes the entire head of the pin will, will come off, but you'll get some cracking in the pin itself. This is how the test is run. Basically, we put this small button into a levitation melting coil. Um, <clears throat> and then we run along a program that basically heats it to the melting temperature, provides a little bit of superheat. This is for a nickel-based alloy. We would take it up to about 1600 degrees centigrade. And then basically, we dump it into a mold, a copper mold, as shown here. And we again, we can vary the length of this mold to vary the amount of, of, of restraint. The typical data is shown here, where we're looking at pin length versus the circumferential cracking. So the degree of cracking around the entire circumference of the pin. Uh, so what happens is we get no cracking. And then in many cases, we get a pretty rapid transition at some critical pin length or some critical strain where we get 100% cracking. And again, in many cases, uh, the head of the pin uh, physically breaks off. The red arrows here indicate typically where cracking would occur in these particular, in these particular pins. Uh, here are some caspenteric test rankings uh, for some nickel base alloys. Uh, Rene 142 and 125 are highly crack susceptible materials. You see that they sit at the far left end of this plot. Alloy 600, wasp alloy, uh, and some other nickel base alloys tend to be at, at the far end. And so the critical pin length to cause cracking, and for example, alloy 600 is up around an inch and a half, whereas the cracking susceptibility for Rene 142 is down at around a half an inch. Um, just uh, some other examples of some filler metals that we've evaluated for the nuclear power industry. Uh, 52M we know has pretty good weldability, resistance to cracking in actual practice. Some of these other materials that have higher niobium contents uh, tend to be a bit more susceptible to solidification cracking. And again, the Caspian tear test is able to differentiate that. Um, <clears throat> so we can basically rank this data by cracking threshold. So what is the critical pin length at which we first get cracking? And you'll see a cascading uh, distribution of, of, uh, of behavior here, again, with the uh, materials on the far left being the most resistant and the materials on the right being the most susceptible. So again, it, it's turned out to be a, a pretty reliable test with respect to predicting solidification crack. So the advantages uh, as I see them is we've got a small sample size, you don't need a lot of material. You can develop one of these curves with about 20 samples, maybe less. There are very few tests variables. Reproducibility tends to be pretty good. It's a great alloy development tool because you don't need much material. The other interesting thing is you can look at dilution effects. And so if you're developing a filler metal and you know that it's going to be diluted 25% by the base metal, you can make a button that represents that particular uh, level of dilution. Uh, we can provide order ranking that we found, at least with nickel-based filler metals, that correlate really well with fabrication experience. The other thing that the Caspian tear test allows is computational models based on the critical strain for cracking. And so we can calculate how much strain it takes to crack a cast pin and then potentially apply that into a computational model that would relate to an actual, actual weld. Okay. I'm getting pretty short on time here so i'm gonna uh within the next 15 minutes try to get through some of the glebal related work that we're doing so <clears throat> we know from the standpoint uh, of the glebal that uh it's an excellent tool for looking at what ha happens at the in the heat effect of zone as i said previously it's basically what it was developed for so we can develop heat effect zone microstructures if we know or can presume what the thermal cycle is in an actual weld. Um, we can also use the Glebal to look at cracking susceptibility and I'll again discuss a, a number of these different uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, 
So again, the Gleeble is, is a thermomechanical simulator. Uh, it's programmable. I think you know most of these things. The heating rates are relatively high. The cooling rate is dependent on the material, your jaw type and your jaw spacing. <clears throat> you can manipulate your sample size to generally get the, the thermal cycles that you need to simulate a, a, a given heat effect that's on in a given material. Um, it can also be used to simulate multiple thermal cycles, post weld heat treatment effects, etc. So any thermal cycle that a heat affected zone sees, typically you can simulate using the Gleeble. It's also been widely used to develop continuous cooling transformation diagrams uh, or time temperature precipitation diagrams. We use, again, this single sensor differential thermal analysis technique to basically measure those transformation temperatures. So here's an example of heat affected zones that would form in welds and a schematic that probably most of you have seen in terms of the different regions that form in the heat affected zone of steels. And again, we can use the Gleeble to basically simulate any of those given regions in a small sample. Here's some, uh, an example of some work we've done with some high strength Navy steels where we can program in the Gleeble different thermal cycles and based on samples that are generated or cooling rates we can look at basically looking at phase transformation temperatures in terms of the a1 and the a3 temperature we can generate samples and then look at for example hardness behavior in this particular steel we actually get a softening phenomenon in the heat affected zone relative to the base metal hardness. And so the Gleeble has the opportunity and the ability to provide a lot of data regarding what happens in, in the heat affected zone. A very common test and probably one of the oldest tests uh, developed using the Gleeble is something called the hot ductility test. What the hot ductility test does <clears throat> is determines the ductility of the material both on heating and on cooling from some peak temperature. So the, the chart here to the right basically shows typical data that you might get. Uh, the, the data of interest to us with respect to cracking susceptibility is what's called the nil ductility temperature or the zero ductility temperature on heating. The nil strength temperature, which is the temperature at which the material has virtually no strength. So this is a temperature that's at or slightly above the solidus temperature of the material and uh, the ductility recovery temperature which means if you heat the material to the nil strength temperature and then cool it down at what temperature does it start to recover its ductility uh, the, the differential between the nst and the drt uh, is very predictive of a heat effect that's on liquation cracking the, the, this test can also potentially be used to look at ductility dip cracking, which would be um, manifested by a, a drop in ductility at elevated temperature. So our, our duct, uh, the procedure used here uses a, a, a quarter inch diameter, four inch long sample. We use a one inch free span. We typically run our tests in argon and we use copper grips. Uh, we determine the nil strength temperature by heating under a very small load, uh, typically 10 kilograms or less. And we simply run the sample up on a linear ramp and wait till it comes apart. And we normally run a couple of those, two or three maybe, to get good statistics on what the temperature is where there's sufficient liquid that the material has no strength. We then perform on heating tests. Uh, to develop this particular curve and identify what the nil ductility temperature is. So this is the point at which the, the ductility of the material based on its, its uh, cross-sectional area failure is essentially zero. Uh, once we determine that value, then we perform on cooling tests after we heat to the nil strength temperature or very close to it, and then cool the sample and then test on cooling to develop this what's called ductility recovery temperature. So when this ductility starts to increase again, it means the liquid films that were formed at elevated temperature start to re-solidify and the material maintains or retains its ductility. 
Uh, I One notation here is that in some materials, it may not be possible to heat all the way to the mill strength temperature without the sample coming apart via melting. And so a temperature midway between mill strength and NDT may be required. This is uh, certainly true for a lot of nickel-based materials. So here's an example of some hot ductility data for uh, stainless steels. Uh, this is type 310. We see our nil strength temperature. We see that the NDT and the NST are almost right on top of each other. And so this differential between NSC, NST and DRT is only about 25 degrees centigrade. If we contrast that to A286, which is a precipitation strength in stainless steel containing titanium, we see a much different behavior where now the nil strength temperature is about the same as the 310, but now the uh, ductility recovery temperature on cooling from this temperature is down around 1050 degrees C. And so now this value is much, much higher by an order of magnitude than for type 310. And we know for certain that A286 is, is very susceptible to heat affect its own liquidation cracking. And so the test is, is predictive of the actual behavior. Okay, uh, I want to spend just a, a few minutes here talking about the duct utility dip cracking and so a Glebel-based test that we've developed to evaluate DDC. So what is DDC? As I showed previously, if we look at a normal ductility signature, it tends to look something like this. A material that's susceptible to ductility dip cracking shows a sudden dip in ductility, typically above about half the solidest temperatures of materials. And so in stainless steels and in uh, nickel-based alloys, this temperature range tends to run from about 800 to 1100 degrees centigrade. Uh, this is what DDC looks like in some nickel-based weld metal. The cracking occurs along what we call migrated grain boundaries. Uh, and uh, again, this is, is Pretty severe case, but this is in an early filler metal that was uh, a high chromium filler metal that was was developed for for welding alloy 690. Uh, it has since been abandoned in most cases as a filler metal because of its susceptibility to ductility dip cracking. So our our approach uh, to this, we actually looked at a lot of different tests to study ductility dip cracking, including the Vera strength test. But we ended up developing a new test called the strain to fracture test. And what this test and it's a global based test, so we've got a dog bone shaped sample. We put a spot weld in the middle of the gauge section of this sample. And we do that to make the microstructure within this spot weld uniform, which uh, increases the reproducibility of the test sample. Uh, we Basically, after making that weld, we condition that so that we've got a, a smooth, flat surface. We put that sample in the Glebel. Uh, we attach the thermocouple, obviously. You can use an L-strain gauge. We also put uh, marks, die marks on the, uh, on the gauge section itself so that we can do a physical measurement. We heat that sample up. We pull it, not to failure, but we strain it to a certain degree, and then we examine the sample to see if cracking has occurred. Uh, these are the types of cracks that we can develop in the strain to fracture tests. Uh, again, they, the, this is, uh, again, for evaluating weld metal ductility dip cracking, and you see the cracking occurs along these migrated crystallographic grain boundaries in, in the weld metal. And this is the type of data you can generate. So you can test over a range of strains and over a range of temperatures. And so strains ranging from about 2% up to 10%. Again, we do not pull the sample to failure. We simply strain it. And then we go in and we count or measure the number of cracks that are present on the surface. And so we can develop basically these curves, which indicates the ductility curve for the material above uh, this, this uh, 
curve, um, um, these curves, cracking occurs below these curves, uh, uh, sorry, below the curve, cracking occurs above the curve, it's, uh, sorry, below the curve, no cracking occurs, above the curve, cracking occurs. And so this represents a ductility curve for the particular material. Uh, the, the one thing that, that we noticed early on, which is sort of interesting, is for most stainless steels and nickel base alloys, the low point in these curves are all around about 950 degrees centigrade. So we started asking ourselves, well, why run all these extra tests out at the extremes, low and high extremes? Why don't we just pick 950 degrees C? And what we show here, these are for a variety of nickel-based filler metals, that the red line indicates the threshold strain for cracking to occur. The numbers here represent the number of cracks. That we can simply test a dozen samples at or less at 950 degrees C to, to basically get that, that result. Here's some additional data uh, for some different filler materials, filler metal 82 is somewhat resistant to DDC. You see its minimum strain is about 4%. Um, and type 304, this is a, a, a different 52X material. This is a, a developmental filler material that we're interested. 304 stainless steel, uh, we know is very resistant to this form of cracking and its minimum strain is up around 2%. And so what we've learned from our DDC studies is when you get to strains at minimum strains at 4% or less, material tends to be susceptible to, to cracking. Plotted in a different way, if we look at behavior at 950 degrees C, if we start to get cracking at 2% or less, then the material, we deem the material susceptible. It intermediate if cracking starts at slightly higher strain. And if, if we can have materials that do not crack up to about 10% strain, we know that they're very resistant to this form of ductility dip cracking. So a lot of filler metal development has been uh, has ba basically been been um, done. Uh, the DDC resistance has been tested using this particular test. Um, I'm going to skip through the mechanism here quickly. Uh, it's, it's basically a grain boundary sliding phenomena and whatever we can do to minimize the grain boundary sliding by increasing the grain boundary tortuosity uh, can improve uh, resistance to DDC. This is some interesting work that we've done with uh, electron backscatter uh, diffraction uh, where in the SEM, we can actually look at low angle boundary distributions in materials. This material has been strained in the Glebal uh, at about 11% strain. And we can develop, basically develop these strain maps. And what this shows is that the strain builds up fairly significantly along grain boundaries and not elsewhere in the material. And again, this is due basically to the sliding phenomena that occurs in this material. Another example, that this at slightly lower strain, again, the raw data from uh, the EBSD strain pattern, and again, the strain pattern uh, uh, color-coded that, that basically shows, again, that strain tends to build along the grain boundaries. So whatever we can do to make these boundaries, in this case, much more tortuous, uh, we can basically uh, increase its resistance to ductility dip cracking. This is another EBSD plot that basically shows a, a weld metal that has high DDC resistance. And you can see how tortuous, irregular these grain boundaries are versus a material with low resistance. In this case, if we apply a strain, sliding of these boundaries is quite easy. In this case, because of the tortuous boundary, those boundaries can't slide because they're basically locked together. And so it's a fairly simple, straightforward solution to the problem simply by adding uh, alloying additions to cause precipitates to form at elevated temperature that results in these irregular grain boundaries. Um, finally, I, I want to talk about a, a test we've developed for, for post-weld heat treatment cracking. Uh, 
This is an example of a post weld heat treatment crack in a chrome molly steel. Uh, this schematic, which you can find in the textbook I referenced, basically shows what's going on, but basically you have a heat affected zone thermal cycle. As the heat affected zone cools down, it develops a high residual stress. Uh, when you perform a post weld heat treatment on it, you get some relaxation of those residual stresses, but you get some metallurgical reactions precipitation reactions that cause that stress to increase. And depending on the level of stress and the ductility of the material, you can get a post-weld heat treatment crack to occur. Uh, so this is basically just describes what's going on in this particular uh, plot. So I'm not gonna uh, belabor that, but again, it requires reheating as most steels and nickel-based super alloys require reheating to a post weld heat treatment temperature to strengthen the material and or to uh, relax residual stresses. So the cracking occurs along grain boundaries, the fracture path, the me exact mechanism is still uh, subject to some debate, but the cracking does occur along grain boundaries. Here's a intergranular fracture in a nickel base alloy wasp alloy. This is a Gleeble uh, test sample and you can see the cracks that have formed along grain boundaries uh, during the during the test. Um, so the procedure that we've developed is basically to take a sample, uh, heat it to a temperature below the nil ductility temperature, so in the solid state, approximately 1300 degrees C for nickel alloys. We hold it at that temperature for a few seconds to get some grain growth. <clears throat> and then we develop a residual stray, stress by straining the material as we cool it. And then we perform a post weld heat treatment at different times and temperatures. And then we pull that sample to failure at the post weld heat treatment temperature to determine the ductility. So this schematically shows what's going on. So this is our heat affected zone thermal cycle portion of the test. Uh, as we cool that down within a certain temperature range, we're gonna apply a strain. And so at the end of the test, the sample was cooled to room temperature, uh, but we built a substantial force or residual stress in the material. We're then gonna perform a post weld heat treatment. And so we take and we heat that material to the temperature of interest and hold it for a given time. What happens to the force or the load is that it initially drops due to relaxation and then will increase, at least in nickel base alloys, due to the onset of precipitation. And this is shown here for two materials, wasp alloy and alloy 718. You'll see a difference between these two and a lag in the 718 due to the difference in precipitation behavior. Wasp alloy is known to be much more susceptible to this post weld heat treatment cracking or strainage cracking than alloy 718. And part of it is this lag in the precipitation reaction. So based on this test, we can develop uh, three-dimensional plots, strength, post weld heat treatment time, post weld heat treatment temperature that depicts both the yield strength, but probably more importantly, the ductility of the material and basically indicates the ductility trough. Uh, we can take different times and temperatures and put them into a plot. So here's temperature after three hours of post weld heat treatment. And so what this test data shows us is that the drop in ductility or the minimum ductility of wasp alloy is below that of alloy 17 and 18. Again, we know from experience that this alloy is more susceptible to post weld heat treatment cracking than alloy 718. And the test technique basically provides that information. So the takeaways, um, from this presentation are that there are lots of weldability tests. Unfortunately, very few of these tests are standardized. These tests are, are in fact very powerful tools for alloy development and for failure analysis, understanding why materials fail and help us improve them from a weldability standpoint. Uh, but there's certainly much more emphasis needed on standardization. And I've been beating this drum for at least the last 20 years that we need better standardization so people running these tests at laboratories all across the world can more readily compare their data. Uh, 
Uh, there's often internal standardization, but there's not international standardization. So things like the vera strain test, the hot ductility test, the reheat cracking test really beg uh, for some standardization procedures. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. Uh, my little cartoon here, those of you who've run the Gleeble, uh know that the Gleeble gives and the Gleeble taketh away. Uh, so it, it's a very powerful piece of equipment from the standpoint of weldability testing. Uh, but uh, you need to understand both its, its benefits and it, its limitations. So I thank you. And uh, if we do have any time at all left, I see I'm five minutes over, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Great. <clears throat> thank you, John. Uh, you're, you're right. The uh, understanding of Gleeble, uh, certainly uh, you know, what, what it can do and its limitations are helpful in presentations like this uh, certainly will, will help people understand understand that. Uh, thank you. We are a bit over on time, so I don't think we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, you know, we went long, but I think people will agree that this uh, the content was very valuable. So, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Lippold, for, for preparing this presentation and sharing your information with us. Um, just uh, in closing, if, if anybody has any technical questions about the operation of the Gleeble, uh, please contact our service team. I've mentioned this a few times in, in previous webinars. We have a new service portal. Uh, it includes a, a useful knowledge base, uh, and you can access that by going to our website, clicking on resources, and then uh, there's the customer support portal uh, location there. You can sign up and, uh, again, access the knowledge base as well as create support tickets, and that's really helpful. If you have any questions about how the Gleeble can support your research, please email me or anyone on our team, and, and we're happy to help. Uh, again, no time for questions, so what we will do is we'll, we'll compile, so we have some good questions, we'll compile those, and we'll reach out directly uh, to answer those questions. And I want to thank our team that did, was able to answer some of those questions live in the chat. Again, thank you, John, for the presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone else, for joining us. Uh, again, please stay safe and healthy. Have a great day or evening. Yeah, and, and uh, again, I'm happy if people want to contact me offline, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any other questions. Great, thank you. And if uh, your email address is not here, uh, I'm happy to make that connection. I think most people here on this call have my contact information. Okay, sounds good. Great, thanks everyone. Thank you.